Akunohana or Flowers of Evil is an incredibly hard work to dissect. It's an anime I would recommend to so many people. It's a manga I would force my friend to read if I could. It's lonely and desolate, yet putrid and angry. Just like the work which gives its name, Le Fleur du Mal. But I don't think they'll understand it. No, they won't. First, I want to make a short introduction for the people who are not aware of the topic at hand because I believe it is of utmost importance that we are all on the same page before starting this video. And I sincerely wish this to be accessible to people who don't watch anime as often or even engage with the medium as much. I bet right now most if not all of you are full of unanswered questions. My goal will be to answer them, so let's begin with the first and biggest one that I'll tackle for now. What is Akunohana? Well, it's a manga series written and illustrated by Shuzuo Oshimi that was serialized in Kodansha's Besatsu Shonen magazine between September 2009 and May 2014. The plot follows a boy named Kasuga who becomes obsessed with French author Charles Baudelaire's book Le Fleur du Mal, or Flowers of Evil in English, and starts dissociating himself from the world around him until he does something which I'll leave for a late, later part of the video and ends up entangling himself with a girl named Nakamura who starts tormenting him in strange ways. From this point onward the show takes a psychological almost horror-esque approach to its storytelling and the plot sort of spirals out of control. Akunohana ended up getting a highly frowned upon anime adaptation that I have my reasons to love. And as such, I'm going to present it today and focus on it, while avoiding spoilers as much as possible and integrating a bit of flair of my own into the presentation. This is indeed the recommendation of the show mostly, but I also highly recommend you read the manga as well. With that out of the way, let's begin. Even before you properly start the video and understand everything, you just pass the intro. I want you to sit a bit here and watch this black screen whatever you have in front of you and the nothingness now that's staring back at you your monitor is probably showing a mirror of yourself carefully watch that person and ask yourself a few questions mostly who are they how did they even get here what was the journey to do so because this questions will be very important down the line. I will tackle this and explain to you what Akunohana clearly is, but first... I think it's important we focus a bit on the volume of poetry first, as it's extremely important to the progression of the story and the mental state of a lot of characters. Le Fleur du Mal is a 19th century poetry anthology written by French author Charles Baudelaire, first published in 1857. It was important in the symbolist and modernist movements, though it was extremely controversial upon publication with six of its poems censored due to their immorality. One very dark book that shows Charles' anger towards the society around him. It's a green book filled with themes of death, sexuality and hate. But most importantly the book deals with decadence, the ruin of society, the way it's slowly decaying and suffering through a twisted form of eroticism. It's disguised itself, it's absorbed in its twisted reality and utterly obsessed with death and corpses. 
It aspires towards the perfect world, a book of evil presenting something curled, a book only our protagonist understands. Yet he resents. All around him fades. This is how Flowers of Evil truly begins. We see a person who has become utterly entranced with the work of Baudelaire, who has started noticing small things in their day-to-day -day life, small cracks that begin knocking in the back of their head as mere thoughts form and try to break out evil and often corrupted thoughts, lonely and quite sad, filled by nothing but poetry to keep existing. Poetry they don't understand. Poetry they relate to without seeing deeper meaning within it. He does not understand. While the primary focus of this video is the exploration of the anime of Akonohana, it's essential to address a significant aspect right from the start, the unconventional animation style. While it appears strange at first, boasting a rotoscoped style, the animation's initial peculiarity, while it may catch viewers off guard, ultimately becomes a powerful tool for storytelling, and reflects the manga author's intention and even in a way cements itself into their later work. If we ever were to get an adaptation of Blood on the Tracks, for example, I'd wish for it to be in this style, as it amplifies and ties together everything in a really interesting manner. It's also a testament to the capability of the director in this instance. It heightens the sense of unease and disquiet that, are, that permeates the series. This feeling being its strongest suit, the style feels realistically grounded and well built upon a story foundation which already flows extremely well together. Upon the re release, however, this caused a stir in the anime community, turning away a lot of viewers and lowering the score on my anime list. Well, almost instantly as a result, even a lot of longtime fans of the manga were in a way thrown off by the way it looked. I think a lot of people weren't exactly ready for it and it breaks my heart that even a few big YouTubers from back then couldn't even give it a chance, calling it unwatchable. Anime adaptation that if you watched, I must applaud you for bearing with its disfigured, ugly animation. I personally cannot applaud myself because Lord knows I don't have the patience to try. This is a shame as the series boasts some of the most intricate and well-defined characters I've ever seen in any work. As such, I'd like to present it to my audience because not only has the anime adaptation become one of my favorite things in the span of a few short weeks, turned months and almost a year now, in actuality I believe the style fit perfectly and gave the characters a way better way of expressing themselves along with amplifying the uneasiness the show comes with by default. It's an utterly nihilistic work that has an interesting edge to it that isn't normally seen in other works. It's self-destructive but in a mesmerizing way. I think the whole series could be summarized within a single quote from the manga author, Shuzuo Oshimi. When you live in Tokyo, you realize that even in the dead of night there are lights everywhere. I've lived here for over 10 years and I'd forgotten all about it, but back in the countryside there are only a few lights. When the sun sets and dusk covers the town, it gets so dark you can hardly see anything. With nowhere to go I'd ride my bike around the outskirts of town and as darkness deepened, I'd feel a helpless despair. I don't want to forget the feelings I had then, as I watched the lights of distant cars speeding through the blackness. Oshimi first read Charles Baudelaire's Le Fleur du Mal in middle school and found the book to feel suspicious, indecent, yet nastily noble. A lot of the essence of Akunokana feels real not only to him but to us as well, because in some ways it is. 
Many aspects of the creator's life are drawn straight into the manga, such as the settings and characters. The settings are based on real locations from Oshimi's hometown, including the school, the library, the riverbank and the park. Many of the characters also have real life models. Nakamura is based on a person who used to call Oshimi things like shitbug and other phrases that Nakamura often uses. Kasuga's friend Hirota was based on Oshimi's middle school friend who betrayed him as well. And even the main character Takao Kasuga is based on himself in a part of his life where he thought he was special, lonely and sad, but special and was just beginning to explore himself somewhat in a sexual manner. That led to a lot of pent up hate to build up within himself. Takao is such a flawed character to an amount that most of his actions feel oftentimes nonsensical, that is unless you understand his core characteristics. He starts off as this quiet kid always carrying a copy of Flowers of Evil with him. He likes zoning out when reading and imagining verses of it or simply transporting himself to a more tranquil space. But there's something wrong with him. One day, he forgets his book at school and when he goes back to take it, he sees it. Pulsating, something draws near him. There's a pile of clothes on the ground. Gym clothes, his crushes clothes, he steals them, a secret concealed and so the first sins revealed, a flower of evil dark and twisted, in the shadows a world once blessed, he steals, and so the first sin is committed, a flower of evil erected. This is where the world of Akunohana starts spiraling into a mess. Somebody saw that. Somebody saw what he did. Somebody knows. First, Kasuka does not realize how deep he's in. Although he does admit that his behavior has created a sin that he'll have to atone for, he starts thinking of a way of fixing it. Seeing his crush cries what pushes him further. He feels the need to escape. Yet, he is plagued by dark thoughts and as he moves around town, he knows it this is all the rust and human greed that drove his city to the ground. City where nobody understands Baudelaire. He begins to scream. Until... Girl lies on an elevated piece of pavement. Her hair is short and her facial expression entails something utterly sinister. She's Kasuga's classmate. She doesn't let him know at first, but she knows. She knows he stole them. I Often, to amuse themselves, the men of a crew catch albatrosses, those vast seabirds, that indolently follow a ship as it glides over the deep, briny sea. Scarcely have they placed them on the deck. Then, these kings of the sky, clumsy, ashamed, pathetically let their great white wings drag beside them like oars. That winged voyager, how weak and gauche he is, so beautiful before, now comic and ugly. One man worries his beak with a stubby clay pipe, another limps mimics the cripple who once flew. The poet resembles these prints of cloud and sky who frequents the tempest and laughs at the bowman. When exiled on the earth, the butt of hoots and jeers, its great wings prevent him from walking. This is essentially how Kasuga perceives himself in the story. A misunderstood poet dragged to earth, an art connoisseur of sorts that doesn't fully comprehend the rationality of a malevolent being like Nakamura. All the while he ends up falling in the same rabbit hole as her. Nakamura is a very interesting character. The whole reason she's even introduced into the plot is to torment Kasuga. 
She is the embodiment of modern day nihilism, the belief that such as knowledge and morality of or meaning should and will be rejected on a base to base individual view. Nakamura isn't a mere antagonist, she is the embodiment of Oshimi's vision of himself had he surrendered entirely to his nihilistic impulses. That's what makes her scary essentially. She's like Kasuga, oftentimes irrational, but not in the sense that he is in which she makes nonsensical choices. She's malicious, she loves misdirection, she is manipulative, and most of all, she enjoys watching people suffer. While Kasuga's stupid mistakes could be attributed to him being quite young and inexperienced with dealing with a lot of the new experiences presented in the show and in his life, Nakamura feels evil and seems to feed upon it. That's why she becomes the puppeteer, she threatens Kasuga that if he does not comply with her absurd demands and enters into a contract with her, she will ruin his life. Bit by bit she wants to tear down every world that makes him shy and every single emotion that leads to him to have remorse and turn him into someone as angsty and hateful of society as her. Because at the end of the day she can see past his kindness. The clash between societal ethics and personal values during the precarious period of puberty becomes the breeding ground for the flowers of evil, which are essentially evil deeds placed under the story's main themes. He does something wrong. Who does Kasuga tell first? His mom? His dad? No, Baudelaire, what's his first thought? His first thought is, has he become a flower of evil? Baudelaire. There's a very clear power dynamic between the both of them and because of the way the story is structured, it's felt with an interesting intensity and tension I haven't seen any other anime replicate. Kasuga has a crush on Saeki, so Nakamura tries to accentuate the fact to an absurd amount. Right from the start, Nakamura messes with Kasuga over those stolen gym clothes and forces him into their contract. Then she starts making Kasuga run into Saeki all the time, making things happen that would embarrass and destroy Kasuga's career if they were to be found out. The whole thing is like a mind game, with Nakamura taking charge of Kasuga's feeling. The stolen gym clothes which started as a big mess become a tool for Nakamura to control how Kasuga sees Saeki and himself and along the way Kasuga loses himself. I'd like to take a moment before going forward to call back to another show which had similar theming to a certain extent. While not really in the same ballpark, the only thing I could compare Akunohana's character development along the series with would be 2015's anime Erased. It's a very weird choice on my part to put the list forward for multiple reasons, and the biggest one being the fact these shows have almost no relevance in their connections. They're essentially like oil and water. Erase this a show about time travel, fixing mistakes and moving on, while Akunohana just holds its nihilistic grudges against its own characters more than half the times. Things that are suffering are shown in both, but the most important parts are the interactions of the main characters with the world, mainly in their interaction with the characters around them stemming from something that we call in psychology social behavior. The main character from Erased has a tonally opposite existence at the start of the show. A lot of the social behavior of Kasuga can be seen within the main character of Erased, Satoru Fujinuma, a struggling mangaka living in Chiba. He has the same sort of hermit-like character archetype, but he differentiates himself not only through adversity, but through goodwill and lack of apathy. Satoru actually being an extremely sympathetical individual that uses an ability called revival to save people from imminent death. Remember how I said earlier that Nakamura is malevolent and mostly can't see the good of Kasuga's heart? Well, it's because all of the good has been entombed by depression and Kasuga tries to heal it by blocking external factors and essentially isolating himself within an escapism complex through Baudelaire's work. By the time we meet Kasuga, he's already far gone. He's deepened himself into a shallow state of depression filled with anxieties and brought a nihilist approach to all his encounters. He has gotten this pompous smart guy air about him, yet he couldn't be further from it. He is not smart, neither is he a good friend to his classmates, that's the reason they abandoned him. 
up until his romantic involvement with both Nakamura and Saeki, Kasuga is essentially isolated from the real world and doesn't get to fall into any extreme. This however leads us to asking an important question not only about Kasuga's complex but about his own sense of rebellion in relation with the outside world. That being, how does Kasuga's romantic involvement with both Nakamura and Saeki symbolize the broader theme of societal expectation versus personal rebellion? Nakamura's role as the antithesis of Saeki is evident. While Saeki, which is Kasuga's crush, represents the epitome of normalcy and societal expectations, Nakamura embodies rebellion and the rejection of these norms. The poignant contrast between the two characters is showcased in their romantic pursuits of Kasuga, emphasizing the way he's supposed to balance himself in between those two, out yet be in a way brought back to normality the way Saeki wants. While Nakamura doesn't care about it that much, she clearly has some feelings there as she tries to prevent Saeki's and Kasuga's relationship from going well. Kasuga is the mirror of reflection and morality, corrupt childhood and the whole entire reason I ask myself often times what I liked about this anime. It's because he reminds me of myself in middle school. Essentially it's Plin. Written down and weathered by the times, the clock strikes three once again, a symphony of sorrow in the poet's pen. I've been Kasuga and he has been me, because in some ways I read an author I couldn't understand and boasted eternally at how smart I was. Maybe time had passed through my era of self-romantization and contemplation of death, where time had stopped once again in its tracks, but I discarded it. In what ways do I relate to Kasuga's struggles and self-reflection during adolescence? It's just, I oftentimes find myself walking back from school and remembering those late winter nights where I couldn't quite conjure the words needed. My place was neither there nor here and all I could think about back then was the poetry I had read at home. And I'd recite it in my head to trying to find some meaning behind its dark, twisted ways it presented itself. I felt the fear of having information revealed about myself and understanding Nakamura on a gradual level really helped me, but she's not here, not in my recalled memory of bullies or people from my life. The times Nakamura has reminded me of someone from my life are few and far between, but her relation to Kasuga is what really sparked an entire memory of its own. The tension the whole dynamic create, creates is just nuts, it's like getting punched in the gut over and over, never getting back up, because this is the real world, you can't just get back up, you need to get it stronger, build yourself and understand what you did wrong. In the words of a good friend of mine, it feels like my balls are being held by the sack and squished constantly. <laughs> the way the show always ends an episode on some sort of bad deed or act of sorts, the way it leaves most episodes in cliffhangers, the song that plays at the end, it's there, it's depressing and nihilistic and tense. Just like the work of Baudelaire, just like Nakamura's worldview. And it's executed perfectly inside the anime. Without a flow, the tension from the manga is just brought through the screen. And the way that's done is through... In order to better immerse ourselves and understand each character and not only that, but to understand why this anime is so good, we need to talk about atmosphere. Every time I even remotely come close to talking about anything atmospheric, I feel the need to relate it back to Ocarina of Time's Forest Temple. Although in a completely different medium, it touches some key points which are of utmost importance. The way sound bounces around your ears, the way it looks and twists in such a surreal manner, it feels alive and sort of evil in ways. Video games often have this obsession with atmosphere because being an interactive medium leads to a ton of room to create a certain feeling through environment. That's the atmosphere, at least the tangible part, the feeling we get through the environment we explore. The same way Dark Souls and a lot of other games do this. I wouldn't tie it directly to anything Akunohana does because it's not like this medium doesn't do that well. 
I'm talking about anime, of course. It's the fact that it's the same sort of helplessness and lack of knowledge seen from the outside perspective. Atmosphere does play a big part in most animes as well. It's what gives Cowboy Bebop its open space jazzy vibe, berserk, its grungy medieval aesthetic and empty open fields that feeling of helplessness portrayed by that and the castaways of, for example, Sunny Boy. The atmospheric quality is the very essence that sets the pacing of the show apart from others, its quality to immerse you and slowly world build before introducing characters one at a time is what proves it's different yet so close to the source material. The classroom scene that mirrors the manga's introduction of Nakamura exemplifies this strategic pacing perfectly. While the manga may present her character in the opening pages, the anime chooses to unveil the crucial moment precisely 16 minutes into the first episode. In the manga, everyone is introduced with relative ease without glossing much over each character. But in the anime, the direction goes to an ungodly amount of work to make them feel like real people, diegetic, and the rotoscoping is just another factor that perfectly constructs that feeling. Each character's introduction feels deliberate. It sounds like his introduction in the anime shows her skills at English. The gaze of Takao in the same scene, as he glances somewhat odd at her, shows some hidden intent, even from the start, deep behind his piercing eyes. Takao's gaze, portrayed as somewhat odd, becomes a visual cue that extends beyond mere aesthetics, and his gaze is often utilized to show his range of emotions but also portray him as a relatively weird kid, and even used to create tension and creepiness in some scenes. It has such many details per scene to an amount that perplexes me and makes me wonder at how much you could overanalyze and cross-analyze each scene. It's the eye movement, it's perfect built into the action and given reaction. The world feels reactive, as most anime wouldn't even focus as heavily on the eye movement Akunohana builds into it and leeches while feeding off of it. Although these factors are introduced lower along with the story, the anime makes such an effort to integrate them in a way that makes them meaningful that I can only applaud it for that. All the changes as such content-wise remain as great as this one, and it's essentially the medium's strongest suit. It's also incredibly accurate to the source material outside the art style. Poses and angles are portrayed in a pseudo-surreal angle most of the time, and when given the liberty they do some cool shots which include extreme close-ups and the unusual angles on their own as well. Background art remains a consistent and powerful tool of the anime, and I can't applaud them enough for that, due to the way characters are also colored and done with flat. It creates this discrepancy between the feeling of the background and of the characters, but because of this you end up often time focusing more on the emotions and facial expressions of the characters and it manages to flesh out each one's features and makes you access your view towards them the entire time. The word I'd use to describe all of this however would be something straight out of Baudelaire's writing and I'm guessing that would be Spleen. In the first part of Le Fleur du Mal, it is spoken about spline ideal. The term ideal refers to the perfect world, exploring the themes of idealized existence. Interestingly, spleen, often misunderstood as merely a term for melancholy, is an organ in English. The term spleen e ideal suggests the idea of sadness that deeply ties into the Roman slash Greek theories about the four fluids or humors. It's a theory that takes blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile and associates each one with a feeling, attributing sadness to the dark bile produced in the spleen. The concept of melancholia in particular stems from this association. 
Essentially, Kasuga's idealized version of sadness and self-deprecating melancholy which aligns with the overarching theme of decadence and Baudelaire's reflection on the corrupted state of the world. The poet grapples with a profound sense of loss and the difficulty of finding genuine meaning in a society marked by moral decay. Like how Kasuga begins by viewing Psyche as his muse before his crush, he sort of watches in real time what Baudelaire feared. And what may that be, you may ask at this point? The collapse of the self, of moral boundaries. In the context of the book, spleen serves as a metaphor for the human condition particularly the alienation and disillusionment experienced in the tumultuous societal landscapes of the 19th century. But it's just more than that. It's anguish. It's hate. I recognize the intricacy of Le Fleur du Mal and I am aware of the fact the anime's take on Baudelaire's work might bring out subtle details that are challenging to fully grasp. As highlighted, the book's intricate layers contribute to its portrayal as a multifaceted masterpiece. That's why what I said so far may be considered factually incorrect in some interpretations. But even as I'm writing this deep into the night, I reflect on my own life and ask myself if there was a possibility for me to be there instead of Kasuga. Maybe I could have taken his place at one point in my life. I was apathetic towards death, desensitized to it. I romanticized it, didn't cry when my great-grandmother died. Maybe I just couldn't grasp it, maybe I was too young or dumb, found it odd. As I sat in place, tearing, uh, tearing my hair out and scrambling my words back to my head as I just bumbled again and again and again. and flabbered all over those words that I was spoken, nothing really made sense anymore. And I wasn't talking of the script anymore, I felt wasted. What was once a simple task of deliverance had now spent my time flying into the nothingness. I'm now spoken, speaking, spoken, doesn't matter anymore. Words don't form logical sentences outside my view or outside yours. What's my time spent on this earth but delving into atmosphere, fog and dust? I've lost counting days and I'm not counting them anymore. Because I've lost them. I've lost the count of days. I've lost counting days working on this. I've immersed myself into the being that is the hermit because I still am in some ways Kasuga. Somewhere deep within myself, I'm still him and he's still me. And the script just screamed back at me. Write me, write me, do it right this time. And I wasn't sure what to do, I just looked at it and I asked myself, am I the one to really do this? Am I in this moment now? Am I present? Am I sane? These questions wouldn't leave my mind for a long time, and as the dusts gathered and left again and again, washing the beach once, twice, thrice, they never came back, to be honest. They never came out. An old lamb base, Cupid is seated on the skull of humanity. On this throne the impus one, with the shameless laugh is gallantly blowing round bubbles that rise in the air, as if they would rejoin the globes at the other's end. The sphere, fragile and luminous, takes flight rapidly, bursts and spits out its flimsy soul. Like a golden dream I hear the skull groan and threat at every bubble. Where is this fierce ludicrous game to come to an end? Because what your pitiless mouth scatters in the air Monstrous murderer is my brain, my flesh, and my blood. Focus back, I screamed to myself, but it was in vain. Music remained at last. I'm going to come back from my existential rambling to provide a somewhat more concise next section. 
I'll dedicate this entire part of the video to a well-thought analysis of the way music works in the show and how well composed it is, similar to how I did in my Boogie Pop video. I'd probably mention the artist, but there's just a little something bugging me for now. I can hear it whispering in the back of my mind as I write the script. I'll ignore the idea for now, but I'll touch upon it later. Throughout the whole video you've heard a variety of songs from different artists, not all of them out of the soundtrack of Akunohana, but most of them falling in that category. I added a list to the description for each track and the order it's played in, so I'm thinking we could all go through the list together and show why the music of the show is so great. But first we'll have to tackle the composer, however. Hideyuki Fukasawa is the Japanese composer of Flowers of Evil, or Akunohana. Born in Tokyo, Fukasawa began learning piano when he was in elementary school. At the age of 10, he listened to the soundtrack of the anime film Swan Lake, which led him to be influenced by Russian composer Pyotr Ilyich Ch Tchaikovsky. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. When in high school, Fukasawa began playing synthesizer, guitar, bass and drums. In 1991, he started his career as a synthesizer programmer. Since then, he has been involved in many works, mainly composing and arranging music for video games and anime. Some of the most likely titles you may have heard of his works are Street Fighter 4 and 5, Fate Grand Order and Stay Night, and Evil Full Metal Alchemist The Sacred Star of Milos. For the following part of the video, I'll tunicate the music that usually plays in the background to further emphasize the soundtrack, and each track in particular while analyzing its style. This will result in a bit of silence while I'm speaking, but will provide the songs when I'm actually talking about them. Let's begin. Fukasawa's work on Akunohana follows a very stark and sharp style of soft piano tunes and harsh synthesizers, at times almost sounding inspired by the likes of Akira Yamaoka, with drowning pads and very few things going in on in terms of melodical progression, like here in this example. Powerful melodic arpeggios and soft bells fill the silence and tunicate it and wrap around the melody itself as they slowly build upwards. Tracks usually consist of lengths around 8 minutes, but they have a design philosophy of gradually building up tension along with time, letting instruments of the caliber of proper drums and even flutes at times to kick into the chaos that ensues in, with each scene. This captures a feeling I can hardly put into words, but it's essentially a one-to-one -one recreation of how I imagined the manga itself would sound. Not only that, but each track name suggests a character or a team of evil within the context of the story, like the way the intros do the same thing. Those of us who have read the manga know how the covers of each volume are represented. Something similar happens with the openings of the anime. There's one for each protagonist and a room for the fourth protagonist, which is represented by the town of Gunma itself. Now, while doing research for this video, I decided towards the latter part to investigate other videos on the same topic. And I came along a video from user Ozzy2, which follows a similar idea of defending the show. Keep in mind, when I found this, I was about 35 minutes into the edited part and recorded part of the video. I decided to watch it to see what he did personally different from myself. 
I actually recommend highly watching that in some regards over this video as it goes more into the headspace of the director itself. But I guess I feel guilty and at fault and need to justify myself before doing anything. There's an emptiness or a void right now behind my black, pearly eyes. That's besides the point. I knew from the start, being a music nerd, that I wanted to do a comparison of the leitmotif of each character's theme that's used as an intro. But I ended up finding out that Ozzy already did that. Which not only led me to having self-doubt about the originality of my video, not only is his analysis of this part spot on, but I now feel the need to point out he timestamped everything amazingly and put together everything in a very digestible manner. This it's just great, so I'm just going to use one snippet to exemplify my point. One small part. While I wish in some regards to be respectful for his work on that, I'll link his video down below for using this small snippet to showcase my point. As I was saying, while the main intros each have drastically different tones, they all end up building into the same light motif, which not only permeates this theme of change and loss, but pushes it further, giving it a feeling of continuity. Here, take a listen. Back to the black screen, all of the sudden. The music holds such a special place in my heart, it's well built and holds this light motive of hope and in a way hopes that you'll come out of this dark place. This dark place that's surrounding us right now, the black screen, the silence, there's nothing left of this video. Not a lot but the screams of the damned. The screams of those who've read it or watched it and understand it to a certain degree. I don't want to be the copycat. I don't want to be the person who ends up copying Ozzy or anyone around me. I don't want to be the trendsetter either. I don't know what I want to be. I just, I chose this platform to speak about my interests. And in a way, this show reflected and showed me a mirror of myself in some regards and I dislike that, I hate it for that reason. I hated the entire time I was watching it, but I was not, not enjoying it. It's odd. I'm leaving pauses. I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. It's fine. All that remains the screams of the damned. The Morning Sun by Edward Hopper is an important painting to me. My admiration for the person who painted it cannot be understated. I feel it reflects in a lot of ways how I felt after finishing watching this show, reading the manga and finally understanding why it clicked so well with me and so many other people. So I searched far and wide, and what I found were the screams of the YouTube comment section of all places. On videos about various topics related to Akunohana, there were hundreds if not thousands of people who have gone through similar experiences. The quote from manga author Oshimi now started to make sense. I dedicate this manga to all the boys and girls who are now suffering from puberty and its torture, and to all those who have been victims of it in the past. I get it now. It's a work about escaping the dark place, the transitional period, the liminal space holding you back, the screams of those who have will be shown. The following section is a collection of YouTube comments from people who want their thoughts to be heard. 
so they will. I'm hoping so. If you're seeing this, I'm happy you commented. This anime will always hold a truly special place in my heart. Watch this during the end of my youth phase and entering adulthood. It's jarring seeing how accurate the portrayal of loneliness and how lonely it feels to be a kid is. To feel so unbel unbelievably not good enough or so incredibly vulnerable to the world. I can relate to a lot of the themes in the show and it breaks my heart knowing that there are so many like us out there who are just so desperate to be heard and loved. It's truly heart-wrenching. So I hold a candle to those in their youth who are lost in the night, to those who feel like they just aren't good enough, to those who feel so incredibly lonely, and to those who just want to be loved. I watched this anime at the peak of my adolescent hostility. I remember having homicidal and suicidal thoughts every single day. I hated myself, but I hated everybody else very fiercely. I spoke maybe three to four times to another person in that entire year. I was sure I was gonna die sooner or later and probably bring someone with me. I knew I was damned. It was a terrible feeling, but I felt so alive and so sure of that reality I felt like I was destined for that. Nakamura was one of the few people I could relate to. Even, even though she's fictitious, she hated everything about this world. Just like me, she just didn't fit in society. The only thing we wished for others is for them to suffer desperately and die. There's a special place that only people consumed in hatred like us can attune to, and it's not a place you would like to make a visit to, I guarantee. If you compare the anime to Nakamura herself, they were treated very much the same way. In the story, no one really bothered to look at Nakamura beyond her swearing. She was uncomfortable to be around, harsh, difficult to understand, alone and struggling, just like the anime was. No one really bothered with this anime beyond the rotoscope. They were simply brushed aside with people saying, this is just ugly trash, I won't bother with it. As they go back, to watching the same old boring crap they always do. Just like Nakamura, Akunohana will always be an outcast. <laughs>